Hello and welcome to another edition of Digital Dialogue from Maritime Gateway. Today we have a guest with us, Mr. Shantanu Bhatkankar, who is a well-known personality in the industry, not only in India, even globally. So uh, he is the managing director of ATC Group, and ATC Group is custom broking, and uh, it's a full-service international freight forwarding company with pan-India presence and also with a global network of associates. Shantanuji is the OPM at Harvard Business School, Boston, and Honorary Fellow of Narottu Moraji Institute of Shipping. Mr. Bhatkankar is a member of Development Council, member governing board of Air Cargo Forum of India, and trustee of the Kelkar Education Trust. He has also served as past president, chairman, and board of advisor to many uh, trade associations like AAAFI, AMTOI, MACCIA, IFCBA, and CSEMP Roundtable Mumbai. Thank you, Mr. Shantanu, for joining us today. We are happy to have you with us. Thank you and Namaskar. So, uh, let me begin this conversation by understanding the trends in uh, freight forwarding. So, uh, which are the key uh, global trends that are affecting the freight forwarding or rather transforming the freight forwarding uh, business? And uh, how do you think the Indian freight forwarding community or their competencies uh, are matching with the changing scenario? Thanks, Mr. Ram Prasad. Uh, nice to be with you all again. Freight forwarding is a ever transforming industry. And since I joined in 81, the change it has undergone is so much that it is almost unrecognizable. What I did when I joined and what I do today has actually no common thread except shipping lines as vendors, truckers as vendors are same and our customers are same. But for that, the structure and the business models have changed completely. The changes in freight forwarding predate COVID. COVID may have accelerated certain trends, but the changes predated. The basic triggers for transformation started in 91 with globalization. That's when the industry exploded. Because it's not just India globalized in 1991, the rest of the world had started globalization a decade earlier. So we all could ride the wave of growth. It is said the decade of 70s was a wasted decade. And it was low growth for all economies, but 80s people started transforming, 90s India transformed. And that's where really the freight forwarding started transforming in terms of every freight forwarder being local started becoming multi-local, regional, national and global. You will not find any global freight forwarder earlier than that. But what happened is for last 10, maybe 15 years, the industry as such has not transformed itself. Some players in the industry have transformed and become a contract logistics player, which is a different ball game. I seen some websites claiming people as contract logistics, but they are not doing contract logistics. Second transformation we see is because of digitization. Digitization has democratized information, it has facilitated processes and eventually it will lead to disintermediation. And disintermediation in freight forwarding has been happening for a long time. You can take example of a freight broker. If I go back to 80s, every single consignment was booked through a freight broker. Today you will find hardly any consignment is booked through a freight broker. So freight forwarder, custom broker have to take note of this. Similarly, we have seen steamer agent. Every location had a steamer agent. Now shipping lines have their own office. And they are not just representative office. They are operational offices. They do all the operations 
in that particular city or in that particular country by forming a company so all these structural changes has brought the shipping lines closer to the customer if that was not enough today ports terminals and shipping lines are doing freight forwarding they are doing trucking they are running railways they are operating ports they have big digital platform one of the big uh, terminals or port company has 250 analyst analyst in delhi for big data analytics so you can imagine the kind of changes the industry is going through so uh, you 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 opened up a, a lot of points for discussion uh, which essentially means there is a lot of pressure on freight forwarding because of these uh, uh, end to end services the 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 operators getting into uh, end to end services but how the indian freight forwarders traditionally most of the freight forwardings are family run businesses they have been there for many many years and you also have been talking on several forums and triple uh, fi uh, conferences that community has to change adapt to change they they should uh, get on to the new technologies service offering should be more so how 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 is it adopting and uh, do you see that uh, the companies are able to uh, adopt themselves uh let us see three dimensions of this question number one is uh, the family ownership port and terminal are not family owned they are mostly government or diversified ownership but if you take four top shipping line three are family owned so family owned has not restrained people from growing and these are shipping lines which are doing now terminal operations they are a freight forwarder railway operator so family ownership i don't think is a barrier coming to changes that we are talking about how the business has changed i have to go back to first industrial revolution and where railways replaced horse carriage now if i was depending on a horse carriage i can't complain that railways are faster quicker more scheduled time arrival scheduled time departure costless can carry more cargo at one time safely so if it brings all the advantages one has to transform the business or discard the business and move into other third point is freight forwarders are survivors if we take darwin's theory or now they don't call it darwin's but theory of evolution we are ever evolution clear and that's why we are survivors so we are one of the earliest assimilators of technology if i look at customers and if i look forward also freight forwarders adopt technology very quickly which is a less spoken less known fact but owning the technology and adopting the technology are two different things people mistake that we create our own platforms or we create our own software for technology assimilation what we do is use the available technologies of our vendors of our customers we build a bridge and we start getting assimilated into their technology and use that technology so freight forwarders have been assimilating what freight forwarders have not been able to overcome is as people became multi local we became even more fragmented because of container and liberalization in customs the specialization as a concept was absolutely now uh, is a thing of past today everything is commoditized undifferentiated and we are a fragmented industry so those premiums we used to get are gone and people have to work on vapor thin margins or nil margin so that we have not been overcome for last 10 years by differentiating ourselves but if you see what some freight forwarders have done can be role model for others now if we take the segment indian subcontinent southeast asia going up to near far east and middle east 
the cargo is controlled by what is called we call NVOCC or box operator. It is Indian freight forwarders who have purchased containers and they have slot chartering agreement on the common carriers. And these are the carriers which the so-called big shipping lines also use. Now you will be surprised and it's very less spoken is it is these NVOCCs and box operators operate throughout these three regions and except for Colombo, they have the dominant market share. So some of them have overcome, some of them have become contract logistics. I wouldn't say digital freight forwarders have still grown that they can be a role model or they have become a big threat. But we don't know, the, the world changes very rapidly and maybe digital freight forwarders will transform the picture and we all will be only digital freight forwarder. And that is happening because of the digitization of the economy. I am not talking digitization of technology. Now we have digitization of economy. Yes. It's happening because of that. And India is the biggest assimilation of digital economy where even the smallest person in village now has UPI payment facility. So we are very strongly into that arena already. Let us look at uh, uh, the environment or ecosystem around us. So a uh, few years ago, uh, we were discussing about a lot of challenges like either infrastructural or regulatory or not having a transparency or not having self-governance which have been negatively impacting our businesses or our service to the customers. So what has changed in the uh, recent years and what needs to change going forward? I would say infrastructure has increased is for sure. If we travel to Northeast, you find airports are excellent. And we had hinterland traveled in Northeast and the roads are excellent. And it is very creditable that roads there are excellent because the terrain is very difficult terrain. And throughout Northeast, the terrain is difficult. And yet we have amazing roads. Now we have no ports coming up. So infrastructure has changed. But what has not changed adequately, I will just highlight two important factors. One important factor is, today India is a three trillion economy, little more, little less. It is said that in one decade, we will be 10 trillion economy. We want to be a developed economy. But if I look around the region, any logistics complex or hub in Dubai or Singapore and then the rest of the world is much bigger than our locations. So unless we become global scale, Mm. And since we are going to become global scale, we have to be super global scale. And we can take that example from Reliance Refinery. From conception, it has been a global scale economy and largest economy in the world. So our aim now has to be the largest, not just global scale, no global good practices, because global good practices are one which people have reached the peak 10 years back, conceived some uh, 20 years back and today we are going to adopt it when they have discarded it and they have moved on to something else. Having technologies and ideas and models of tomorrow and global scale infrastructure, manufacturing hubs or logistics hubs is going to be critical if we have to triple our GDP. It won't happen without that. Next point I would say is we have infrastructure now growing, but we still have bottlenecks. No infrastructure should be used beyond 70% and it should be at completion at the point of usage 10 years ahead of requirement. That is the minimum adequacy. When I say global scale, it has to be a lot more than that. The next point is our infrastructure is not seamless multimodal. Government wants to reduce logistics costs and logistics costs can be reduced only by 
having systems and processes re-engineered or redefined or have a new model itself. Now we have to disallow any infrastructure which is not multimodal, particularly if they are getting a strategic asset like a port or an inland waterways terminal or a railway terminal. These are national strategic assets. You can't say that investor will do its best. No. Then he takes care of his profits and not his economy. And I am not against people taking care of its profit. But that ecosystem has to create competition for at least three modes. What ICDs we have are connected either by rail or by road. But if you take place like Basel, it has a gateway port of Antwerp or maybe Rotterdam. It has inland waterways, barges moving upriver. It has railway coming from the same port and road also is there at the same terminal and same gantry crane works across. It therefore becomes a secondary hub and in one move they can shift cargo instead of multiple moves that are required in India. Now that seamless infrastructure will reduce transit time, will reduce wastage, bring in tremendous efficiency and bring down the cost. And since each mode will be competing with each other, we will be able to avoid monopolies. We always said government monopolies are bad, but private monopolies are even worse. Right. They are disastrous. So the way to deal with private monopolies is to create a competitive structure of different modes within the same infrastructure. And that will give us the necessary infrastructure with least amount of space being required for it. You have extensively addressed the infrastructure issue, but I want you to comment on the regulatory framework and uh, uh, how is it uh, today? Uh, do you see a change in the uh, policy makers or the decisions that they are taking or the congenial to the uh, trade requirements? Uh, I am still not satisfied with the change in policies. The liberalization is not adequate and what is so-called trust-based system just doesn't exist. There is no trust. Everywhere the declarations are very strong and I can say as far as custom broker is concerned, the number of cases in which custom broker gets charged and then has to struggle for getting exonerated have increased exponentially. I would say 35 years or 40 years I've been working. In entire 35 years we didn't have a single case where we as custom broker were implicated for something. Now it has become a common place whether the customer makes any mistake and these are mistakes. You don't criminalize mistakes. Mm -hmm. And when you start criminalizing mistakes, you create criminals. So this is, I would say, extremely negative. Not just mistake by a customer or a port or shipping line. They implicate everyone and you have to undergo a very traumatic process and which actually is preventing many of us from investing. We do have a lot of assurances, circular coming up, case to case. We can protect ourselves, our associations come to protect us. But according to me, this should not exist at all. So this point, I would say penalties are severe and they are used mercilessly. And you can see in courts, we win in most of the cases. Hmm. So it is a case of accountability also. There has to be a significant accountability that you have made an Indian businessman suffer is actually you are doing harm to the economy and a lot of our management time and our independent time for thinking for growth, thinking for innovation is lost in this and it is very de demoralizing. So I would say this is true in most laws the punishments are higher and I would say when you have imposed so many conditions on us, when you have asked us to make every transaction digital, at least logistics industry and custom brokers 
every transaction is digital every transaction file goes through a gateway so every transaction is captured by one government or other then we should not be required to file any returns at all like why should i file gst returns why should i file income tax return when every transaction of mine is digital and government has data in one form or other and then sign all the declarations in blood so what is said trust based is i have to sign a declaration in blood and then they will raise several objections so what we say is there is no corruption now because of this technology but if you are stuck there is a extortion so i think this system has to change rapidly people are shy and scared to say about it but somebody has to say that and we all have suffered i can tell you without exception everybody has suffered but people are scared to speak about it and the bigger the players not in our industry i am talking more about my customers bigger they are they are more scared to speak about this but uh, uh, we have been hearing that there is a lot of uh, uh, customers has brought a lot of changes and they are more friendlier uh faceless uh, assessments are there so a lot of things we have been hearing in fact i would say faceless is retrograde faceless is there is someone at the other side in some other city the trade all over the world and train in india was humanless it was system assessment so i wouldn't say faceless is a progress toward being more friendly and challenges of faceless have been admitted by the customs also that the documents going elsewhere has delayed the cargo and our federation has presented statistics for it so faceless was definitely not user friendly and it was going back from system assessment i would say customs is one of the early assimilator of digitization most transactions are digital but that doesn't justify the factors i mentioned if one has improved in 10 areas that doesn't mean you make the ecosystem and the stakeholders suffer in two areas so i am not a believer that okay now i have cured you of two elements you suffer the third one no a patient has to be healthy if you want a person or workman to be productive he has to be fully healthy you can't say that you are slightly crippled and slightly unhealthy now don't complain about it you want our business and industry to be fully productive do better contribution to economy bring greater efficiency bring down logistics cost you can't say that okay i have done so much now it's your duty to suffer the rest i don't agree with this approach uh let us uh, address a slightly different uh, issue so uh, digitalization we have seen everywhere it has been adopted and uh, people are sailing with the trend but now sustainability uh, has become very central uh, to our industry so in 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 freight forwarding community how how are we uh, adopting to this transition of uh, having sustainable practices uh, uh, in cargo movement i think esg as it is called is a global movement and climate change protecting planet is a global movement and the whole world has adopted it whole ecosystem has adopted it and if you read there are two sides and both sides will convince you one it is a big source of consultancy second it is a tool of disabling the people who are coming up and competing when you become less competitive you change the rules of the game that is also true but equally i think we have to protect the planet there are good reasons for sustainability and above all like csr corporate social responsibility every business every individual has to have his own commitment to sustainability we have always seen the rest of the world also have been charitable see all the hospitals charity hospitals see all the educational institutes 
without somebody donating will they have come up will government have built all the hospitals and uh, educational institutes it's impossible it's someone who has donated and contributed to charity that has brought in lot of things i would say sustainability i am constructing a building in pune for my own corporate functions and we are making it a green building no making it a green building doesn't give me any financial or any fsi means additional space advantage because that place has other limitations of height and the uh, space i have to live on the borders so i still am going for the best possible green building because i feel good about it my colleagues feel good about it that we are in a space that is environmentally friendly we are contributing to the uh, damage to the environment as less as possible and if possible we are making a positive contribution by using technologies that use less water less electricity we generate our own electricity by solar panels we recycle air in a better way these are all expensive things people say it doesn't cost i know i'm paying for it it costs a lot it costs a lot in planning it costs a lot in designing it costs a lot in getting different equipment for example the taps now we are going to use use less water but it's a prohibitively expensive technology we are still going to use it because we feel happy about it so i would say this thing should be done primarily by education and sensitization and i have great faith in people and business community that we will adopt this as a good practice and then by peer pressure like most of my customers have certain standards for trucks and truck drivers it's not by government law it's by voluntary adoption by my customers i think that kind of ecosystem we should do we have dreams to be a developed economy a advanced nation by 2047 you can't be a developed economy and a advanced nation where we don't have adult adult respond, uh, relationship and where we don't have the principle of self responsibility uh, as you just mentioned 2047 that reminds me few weeks ago uh, we were uh, joyous because india uh, jumped uh, up uh, some places on the logistic performance index but uh, we have been discussing there are still lot of uh, challenges to be addressed uh, 2047 now we started talking about where india turns 100 what should be uh, what, what are the key three four pointers areas where both government and industry should focus uh as you mentioned uh, the our industry becoming uh, uh globally efficient uh, logistics in aspe can i ask you a question what is the percentage of patents we have what is the percentage of big brands we have global brands we may have indian brands in india but global brands when you want to be a developed or advanced economy i think we should invest far many more times in research including research in pure sciences it is research in pure sciences that triggers research in technology we have to be more innovative when you say global best practices you are a copycat can you be a copycat and be a vishwaguru what kind of vishwaguru you will be if you are copying the people to whom you are supposed to be a guru i think first is that mindset has to change and we have to invest and be research focus and that sensitization should come from age of 8 or 10 next is i would say everything we do now if we want to triple our economy size in 10 years which is a huge challenge unless we do everything that is global scale it is unachievable if we grow at 4 5 8% you are not going to achieve such a massive growth and you are not going to be a developed nation or advanced nation and for that i will give you a statistical case my numbers are approximate they are not exact but 
I have simplified the numbers so that we can talk percentage very easily. If Maharashtra, which is the most advanced state in the country, then we will be Germany and Sweden put together. Like population density of Maharashtra and Germany is similar. Population landmass we are similar. They are more green than us. And I am adding Sweden because they are more advanced than even the rest of the Europe. Their per capita GDP is advanced. And if we put population together, our population exceeds, Maharashtra's population exceeds than Germany. Per capita GDP, or if I go to even better per capita income in Maharashtra is around $3,000 per year. Actually, I am giving national figures, but there is less difference. We are simplifying it. So if our per capita income is $3,000 per year and Germany's is say $50,000 and Sweden is $80,000, if we grow by even 10%, we are adding $200 to that person. And if they grow by even 1%, they are adding $800. So that gap is widening. So we have to rapidly grow our people. Best thing that's happening in India is states are competing with each other. I would say now we have to come out of that, particularly the leading states like Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra and Telangana even more because they are very progressive and very agile in adopting changes. We should start comparing ourselves first with Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, not with our neighboring state. And then next step, we should compare ourselves with a European and advanced economy of our size. And then take steps to reach that scale, give that living standards to the people. And it is a well-established fact that unless we become middle income economy, we won't become innovative. Because the focus of person from childhood is different. Mm. And why there is more research and innovation in Sweden is, they don't have other moderations. Their countries celebrate research academics. So people are academic. If we celebrate only IT and say politics or bureaucracy as a career, then people will pursue those uh, careers. So this is one big transformation and I am not saying this is for government to do. This is more for the corporates and individuals to do than government. But government has to bring the necessary environment for that. Going forward, I would say now we are a confident nature. As much as we are a confident nation, the rest of the world looks towards us with greater confidence. So we should rise to that occasion. We should stop copying others and we should now start taking big leaps, which I can say there are two very respectable examples in India which can show that we are ahead of the rest of the world is our digital payment system. The penetration of UPI and all other platforms, Aadhaar card, I think it has transformed and it is very inclusive in nature. Nobody can accuse India of our digital system not being inclusive. It is the most inclusive system in the world. Second good thing that's happening is ISRO. And most of the ISRO scientists are not from the famed institute. There are some. But there are others from second-run institutions and even less known institutions who are doing brilliant job over there. So that's a remarkable example of what we can achieve. And if we take example of ISRO, we are successful because we are not copying anyone. We have evolved our own methods. For example, instead of actual trials, we are doing trials on computer models. We are using different techniques of low energy orbit, using orbit and what is called what uh, slinging. There is a word that used like we use for as a sling. So they are using technologies and techniques that are different from rest of the world as used so far. 
I think that should be the role model for everyone in everything, not just research, even in business, even in governance. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today and sharing a lot of insights into ranging from our trade practices, the global trends, how the transformation is happening, and how India should rise to the global challenges and uh, reach the uh, pinnacle by not copying, by being innovative, by having a lot of in introspection. So uh, always it's a pleasure uh, to have a conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll see you soon.